Uh, my name is Trevor Lund. I'm MLA for Lagan Valley. It's my very pleasant duty to welcome you all here today, particularly the young people, maybe I should say young adults, who are here to ask the questions and uh, inform themselves about the candidates and about the, the attitude to Europe. Uh, if you haven't been in here before, this, this is actually a very famous chamber. This used to be the, the upper house of the old Northern Ireland Assembly, so it would have been the equivalent of the House of Lords. And it was also used uh, during the war as an operations room. If you see the inscription above my head, the Royal Air Force used it at that time. As a lot of very famous people have spoken here and, and have been grilled in here and have asked questions. So you're, you're walking in some quite well-known footsteps. If you look at that picture on the wall to my left, you may recognize some of those people. That was the previous assembly. But John Hume's there and Ian Paisley, Jerry Adams, various other VIPs. So it's, as I say, you're very welcome here. I hope you have a, an interesting and intelligent debate. I hope you find out the answers to the questions that you want to ask. And I'm now going to hand you over to Jim Fitzpatrick, who's going to chair the event officially. So have a good day. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Trevor, uh, for the welcome, for sponsoring uh, this event. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, this is very much an event that uh, is about uh, you taking part uh, as much as listening to what our politicians here have to say. Um, and actually, I was going to ask, you see the, the, the wearing away at the, at the cloth there? That's to do with when they went out to vote, the different sides and so on. Uh, so that's over the years you can see what's happened. When people went out to vote into the different lobbies, they, they sometimes touch the the cloth for good luck or whatever. We've got a different system today for you guys uh, who are, are taking part in the voting. And you have these little um, uh, doofers here. Has everybody got one, by the way? Let me just uh, check. Uh, anybody missing a, a voting uh, doofer, for want of a, a technical word? <laughs> um, OK, well, listen, to tell you how these things work, uh, and uh, Bill assures me it's just like uh, you know, millionaire, basically, if you think of it as in ask a friend or ask the audience more. Uh, this is what it is. It's who wants to be a millionaire. The only difference is there's no money up for grabs, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, what we'll do at different stages, you will be asked uh, to vote. You'll see your options up on the screen. Uh, and uh, then just simply select your number. There's a 30-second window. When I say vote now, uh, then you vote. Uh, and you have to vote within 30 seconds. It'll be registered. You don't have to press send. You don't have to point it uh, towards anything in particular. Uh, and uh, essentially, your vote will then be registered. It's anonymous, so you don't need to worry about anybody... Uh, Looking at you. Also, it's it's you know in in, in uh, a sort of break with Northern Ireland style. It's one person, one vote. Uh, you know, <laughs> you can't vote. <laughs> you can't vote any earlier than the 30 seconds. You can't vote after it, and you can't vote more than once. As soon as you've pressed the choice, it'll be registered. You can't change it either. Okay, so make up your minds within that window. Press the number, and uh, that'll be the vote. And I also want just to test that out. Actually, if you don't mind, we've got a little uh, question here for you. A very simple question. Have you been to Stormont before? Okay, that's the question. You can see on the screen your options. Press one for yes, don't press it yet. Press one for yes, two for no, three for don't know, no opinion. Everybody vote now. <laughs> the seconds are ticking down now. So we wait for the dramatic results of whether or not you have been here before. Simply one, two, or three. I think uh, the votes are coming in there. Are they done? Yeah, those in the corner here. We can see the clock coming down. And uh, that's it. Our time is up. Okay, so we can see that 70% of you have been here before. Uh, 15 haven't, and somebody doesn't really quite remember. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's confusing. You're not normally here on a Friday, anyway. <laughs> Um, so listen, it's, it's great to have everybody here. Uh, we're looking forward to a really good and lively debate. Uh, it is your opportunity to ask some direct questions and to let your opinions be known. Uh, so please take the opportunity uh, and let's uh, make the most of the next uh, little while we have here. Uh, so could I say a very big welcome uh, to our candidates and to those representing the candidates for their parties uh, with us today. Uh, in alphabetical order, just uh, uh, going along, uh, we have Alex Atwood uh, from the SCLP. We have Danny Kinnahan uh, from the Ulster Unionists. We have Mark Brotherson uh, from the Conservatives. We have Mervyn Storey from the DUP. Uh, we have Phil Flanagan from Sinn Féin. Uh, we have Ross Brown from the Greens. Uh, Stephen Farry uh, from Alliance and Tina McKenzie uh, from uh, NI21. So you're all very welcome. I think we should give our, our candidates uh, uh, a welcome. 
Uh, and uh, just to get things moving, what I'm going to do is ask them to, uh, in two minutes, uh, give us an opening position uh, on uh, why you should vote for them or their party. Uh, but uh, before uh, we do that, what I want to do is just kind of sort of test the temperature with you and find out who you would vote for uh, if you had a chance right now. And I'll explain uh, the options, if you can see on the screen or on the TV screens. Uh, you can see there's seven options there. Uh, some of them have been grouped together. If you look there at number five, it's just simply because there's not enough room really on the screen to put up uh, all the options. So, uh, <laughs> and also the rule is, and I've been, uh, is that apparently those that are left uh, to vote uh, as single options had to get 10% or more uh, in the last uh, vote. So, uh, basically, your options are one, two, three, four. Uh, and if it's TUV Conservative or UKIP, it's number five. Green, NI21 or Alliance is number six. Uh, and uh, seven is if you're not uh, going to vote. Okay? Uh, so, uh, everybody, uh, think about who you might vote for according to those options, and if you could all vote not. So, our results are in. There we are, look. <laughs> Let's uh, put that one into the, into, the, into the polling predictions there. We can see uh, the biggest group uh, is uh, number six there, uh, which is Green, uh, NI21 and Alliance. I'm sorry we can't break that down any further uh, at this stage. Uh, then uh, the other uh, votes we can see, that we've got uh, the SCLP there on 13%, Sinn Féin 19%, the DUP on 4%, uh, the UUP on 6%, uh, the other block there, I'm afraid, uh, are on 0% at the moment. Maybe you've got some work to do here, uh, Mark, in persuading people. <laughs> and uh, then there's actually a substantial there who wouldn't vote, 13% uh, saying they wouldn't vote. Now, uh, it'll be interesting. We're going to take a, a, you know, a poll at the end today, so please feel free to change your mind. The funny thing about voting, and sometimes people in this uh, part of the world don't realise it, is it's a matter of choice. Uh, you don't have to vote uh, the way you're told. You don't have to vote the way your parents voted. Uh, in fact, you're allowed to change your mind. Uh, so with that, let's hear from our candidates. Uh, as I say, beginning in alphabetical order, uh, and uh, you've got two minutes each uh, to impress these people, uh, to persuade them uh, of your merits and the merits of your case. And if we could start, please, with Alex Atwood. Alex, and I'll give you a microphone here. Uh, thank you, um, and uh, you're all very welcome. But before I start, could I congratulate somebody in the audience? Because earlier today, one person in this room discovered that she was going to be the head girl of uh, Hazelwood Integrated College next year. So would you like to stand up? And <laughs> congratulations. Actually, I just realized in my, my own, uh, I made a, a slight uh, mistake there not to tell you about the Wi-Fi, because I don't know if anybody wanted to tweet uh, in here uh, today who wants to be connected. Let me just t tell you that if you find uh, on your Wi-Fi there, uh, NIA Open is what you're looking for. Uh, NIA Open. Uh, keep your phones on silent, by the way, but you can, you're welcome to tweet. Uh, the password is welcome, with a capital <coughs> W, welcome, with a capital W, 2013. So don't say that Storm is behind the times, but it's uh, welcome, with a capital W, 2013. NIA Open is the network you're looking for. And if you are tweeting on today's event, uh, the hashtag uh, that uh, is recommended is hashtag NIMEPs. N-I-M-E-P-S. <coughs> okay? Uh, so, without further ado, back to Alex. <coughs> So um, yesterday, uh, Tina and myself were up in Portrush, and the best part of that uh, event was when a number of uh, disabled adults did a, a short play. And the play was about the woman's right to vote. And the play went back through history to before 1998, when women denied, denied the vote, and through 1918, when women got the vote, and thereafter. And that's the first point I want to make to you that if you are 18 or you're approached 18, take the opportunity to vote because it was hard won and it needs to be preciously guarded. Secondly, even if you don't vote, I would ask you to be politically active because as somebody once said, given your age and your character, you have an appetite for adventure over a love of ease and you're less likely to cling to outworn slogans and obsolete dogmas. 
So whatever your politics may be, I would encourage political activism to bring about bold, radical and decisive change. I would ask you thirdly to be pro-European and very brief reasons. I am named after a man who lies in an unmarked grave uh, on the Belgium coast in a place called Newport. My great uncle, Alex Atwood, who was killed in the First World War. His anniversary is in 1917. This is the 100th year. And Europe has brought about, because of integration and cooperation, an end to war in much of Europe. Not of all of Europe, but in much of Europe. Secondly, if we are going to address the big challenges of our society, and there is arguably no bigger challenge than climate change, we have to coordinate our efforts across the European Union and the world in order to reduce emissions, increase use of renewables, and try to save the planet from man-made disaster. Thirdly, if we are going to deal with the international obligations we have, especially to the developing world, then we need to coordinate that in Europe. Uh, it is little known fact that there are over 400 million people, women in the world, who are, live in countries where domestic and sexual abuse is not a crime. Every minute, every minute, a woman is infected with HIV uh, acro across the world. And the biggest cause of death among adolescent women in the world is childbirth and pregnancy. So Europe can help deal with all of that, never mind deal with all the other benefits that it brings to us as members of the Union in terms of trade, farming and inclusion politics. Thank you very much. And uh, Danny Cannon. Thank you very much. And if I can just start with a story, you all know I worked in the art world. William Connor was caught drawing on the wall at school. And instead of being punished, he was sent off for art lessons. And that's the artist in that painting. And that is really the way we should be looking at everything that happens in the future, finding the constructive way forward of doing it. Now, I'm not the candidate. I'm here in place of Jim Nicholson because I'm afraid he, he had uh, something else he'd already got in the diary and couldn't change. We're pro-Europe, but Europe isn't necessarily run in the best way. So we've said that we want to see it reviewed, we want to see it renegotiated, and of course we're for a referendum. But Europe isn't like Northern Irish politics. Europe is working as a team, and the Ulster Unionists, the DUP, and the Sinn Féin have been there to date, and Jim Nicholson has the most experience of anyone there. It's about working together, and they all work phenomenally well together. They've just, in the, I think since 1988, got over seven and a half billion money to come back here. And that is what helps Northern Ireland, whether it's peace money, whether it's agricultural, whether it's to help cause us to change our attitude to climate change, environment, it is all part of it. And Jim, with his experience, sadly isn't in Northern Ireland most of the time because he's there very much leading in Europe. He's part of the team negotiating in Europe with how we work with the US and all the trade with the United States and the Europe. And that is phenomenally important. And it's also trying to place all the goods that we produce, not just Northern Ireland, but Ireland, so that the European goods are saleable to the rest of the world because we can rely on them as safe food uh, and um, safe technology. It is about being part of leading Europe forward. This isn't just about Northern Ireland, although he's there working for Northern Ireland. It's leading Europe in the rest of the world. And Jim is there. He's one of the rapporteurs. He's one of the very, very top people in Europe at helping create change. And so when we ask you to vote for Jim Nicholson in the election, he's got the experience, he's known by all of them, and he's very much part of the team that makes Europe work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny. Um, <laughs> buying on time as well, so thank you for that. Uh, Mark, Mark Brotherson from Conservatives. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, I've got a massive task starting from ground zero. Um, but I'm in with the TUV and UKIP. So I'm Mark Brotherston and um, I'm representing the NI Conservatives as the EU candidate. The NI Conservatives have a very clear message in this European election. If you want real change in Northern Ireland and in Europe, then vote for, for the NI Conservatives. The reality is that we're the only party in the room today that can offer a referendum to you on a reformed EU. The only party that can do that, despite what you hear anywhere else. We're also the only centre-right party which is absolutely and totally focused on 
economic regeneration of Northern Ireland. So let's be clear, decisions in the implementation of European matters and funding are made at Westminster, and then the allocation of funding and, and, and other decisions are then um, allocated through to Wales, England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And we, the NI Conservatives, are the only party that can take you from the Council Chamber locally to the Cabinet table and to the European Parliament. We have that direct link. We're consistently working hard in Northern Ireland in the social enterprise, voluntary and business communities. We're passionate about rebalancing the Northern Ireland economy by proactively focusing on growth of our private sector, the voluntary and the social enterprise sectors. We believe Northern Ireland's education system must be seamlessly correlated with economic, social and cultural development in order for Northern Ireland to successfully rebalance the economy. We encourage innovation and celebrate entrepreneurship, not just in Europe or in the United Kingdom, but also in Northern Ireland, which in turn, we believe, assists our private, voluntary and social enterprise sectors to transform challenges into, op into opportunities. We're dedicated to improving sources of finance for the private, uh, voluntary and social enterprise sector, including simplifying uh, EU finance schemes and funding initiatives that will facilitate skills development and, and job creation. Time, uh, so each and every one of you in the room, vote for the NI Conservatives as we will lead by example and, and we will champion change for the private sector and in the European Parliament and we will, we will create new opportunities for business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, next up, uh, we have Mervyn Storey uh, from the DUP. Mervyn. Thank you, Jim, and can I welcome everybody to the Senate Chamber this afternoon. Normally, I'm here on a Wednesday chairing the Education Committee, so it's out of my comfort zone to be here on a Friday afternoon, but not out of my comfort zone when I see so many young people who are here and making your voice and your opinions known to us as politicians. The European Union is important to us for many, many issues, namely the first, and that is we need to ensure that we maximise the benefit from the European Union structures. European Union is not what it once was, it's not what it is, and it's not what it should be. However, in the future, it has to change. No institution, whether it be this institution, whether it be any other political institution, uh, can remain in a static position because we have to ensure that we reflect the changes in our society in a way which is to the best of our community. When it comes to ensuring that Northern Ireland has its place at the table, Diane Dodds, I believe, has ensured by her place as a full-time member of the Agricultural Committee, the first MEP from Northern Ireland to sit on the President's Committee, has clearly demonstrated that she has the capacity and the ability to be able to ensure that whether it is a fisherman in Port of Ogie, whether it is young people in terms of the various schemes and plans and programmes that emanate from Europe. She's there to ensure that there's a voice heard which reflects your views, your opinions and the future of Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a different place today. It's not the same place that it was when I grew up as a young person in North Antrim. However, we need to ensure that whether it's Stormont, Westminster or Europe, we maximise the benefit for our young people because our young people are our future. Agriculture is a vitally important industry to Northern Ireland. It is very, very regrettable that there are other parties standing in this election at this, on this occasion who seem to have abandoned the farming community. The debate around the single farm payment, which will affect us all. And let's remember everyone in this room to a lesser or greater degree is dependent upon the agribusiness, the food industry and the farming industry. We need to support our farmers to support the future of Northern Ireland and that's your future as well as mine. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mervyn. Uh, next up, uh, Phil Flanagan uh, from Sinn Féin. Phil. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm delighted to be here to represent Sinn Féin um, and represent Martine Anderson, who's Sinn Féin's MEP in Europe, who unfortunately can't be here. I want to thank the Integrated Education Fund and Lucid Talk for organising this event. And I also want to point out that I'm very impressed with Jim's iPhone cover. I thought he was standing holding a cassette, uh, but it's actually the back of a phone, so it's pretty cool. Um, I think it's important that, that we, as elected representatives, that we as politicians, and, and particularly people that are standing for election looking for your vote, um, outline to you 
um, the people that <clears throat> elect us, that put us into our jobs to represent you, know where we stand on certain issues. So I think events like this are brilliant. I love getting out and about to meet people. Um, I don't think enough people come up to, to Stormont to engage with politicians. So events like this are very helpful for us as politicians to engage with people and for, for you to put your issues um, on the table here. Um, I believe that, that um, these elections, both the European elections and the Council elections, are, are crucial. Um, I think they're very important in, in determining how we, we move forward. Um, growing up as a young person from West Fermanagh, from I had no interest in politics. It was never something that was discussed around our table at home. Um, and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Um, but here I am. Um, but I learned um, as a, a young person and as a young adult the positive impact that politics and, and good politicians can have on the lives of people. Um, so that's why I'm here um, in politics representing people. Um, and I think, like most people in society, um, I have an interest in what happens in the future and not so much on the issues that dominate the media agenda sometimes that um, the media portray the things that we seem to always talk about here, but I don't seem to ever see those debates that the media talk about. So we need to look towards the future. Um, the future of, of the European Union um, is a very important debate, but it's one that um, bores an awful lot of people. You know, who really gets excited about what the future of Europe holds? Um, but there are some big issues that's going to be debated in Europe. Um, there's things that we need to see serious change on in Europe. Europe at the minute is far too focused on promoting the needs of, of big business. Um, and I think it needs to deliver for, for people here in terms of unemployment, emigration, and an end to the austerity policies that exist. And I just want to respond to something that Mervyn had said, um, where he said that Europe and some parties have abandoned the farming community. But unfortunately, the only MEP from the north in Europe that voted in favour of keeping the European budget to keep the cap budget was actually the Sinn Féin MEP. Both Diane Dodds and Jim Nicholson voted to reduce the budget. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll mark that for, for responding later because it's just uh, statements at this stage. Okay, uh, can we have our next candidate, please? Uh, Ross Brown uh, from the Greens. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. <clears throat> Thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm here representing a Green, uh, the Green Party, a party that's big in Europe with 48 MEPs already in the European Parliament. And I belong to a party which does operate effectively on a transnational and an all-inclusive basis. While others might expect you to vote for them on the basis of their identity, as a young person representing the next generation, uh, I'm asking you to vote for us because of our ideas. The Green Party is strongly supportive of the principle of the European Union. We see the value uh, that the European Union brings in, in, a, in an international democratic framework to solve all sorts of international problems like corporation tax avoidance, overfishing, or financial market regulation. We see the value for international relations that an international democratic uh, framework creates. And as a party, we are supportive of the principle of solidarity insofar as we believe that ensuring those with more um, have a duty to help those in less fortunate circumstances. While we're strongly supportive of the principle of the European Union, we're deeply unhappy, however, with the direction it's taken. We've seen deregulation, the financial crisis, and the imposition of collective austerity that has threatened or destroyed many of the hard-won social, economic, and democratic achievements that we've had. Today, we've got a situation where 25% of Europeans are th uh, threatened with poverty, and uh, we've got 27 million Euro uh, Europeans are unemployed, with almost uh, one in five of those being young people. And as an economist, I understand that uh, sometimes tough decisions have to be made, but I also understand that the, the collective imposition of austerity uh, to get us out of debt was the equivalent of digging ourselves out of a hole. Alongside this, my generation is facing an unprecedented, and your generation as well, environmental crisis, which is already having a serious impact on the, the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. And policymakers of this generation, unfortunately, have failed to make our economy sustainable for the future. Europe is essential for building the more sustainable, democratic, and equal society that we're calling for. Taming the forces of financial markets and of global corporations, effectively fighting tax fraud and tax evasion, transforming Europe's energy supply to combat runaway climate change. These are all examples of ways in which uh, the, the Europe, uh, we need to change Europe that are beyond the capabilities of even the largest of our member states. So today I'm asking you to put aside your identity politics and I promise to act as an elected representative to bring a new style of politics to Northern Ireland, leave the sectarian baggage behind and work for the interests of everyone and in the interests of the common good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ross. Uh, next up, uh, Stephen Farry uh, of Alliance. Stephen. 
Uh, thank you very much, Jim, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can I first of all join in thanking uh, both the IAF and Lucid Talk for hosting uh, this afternoon's event, and also to pass on apologies from Anna Lowe, who's uh, unfortunately double booked with some other media engagements today. So hopefully, I'm a, a satisfactory replacement for for Anna. Um, I think our, our key message here is about being very positive about Europe, being proud, being passionate about Europe. Far too often, we're letting the opponents of the European Union set the agenda, and those of us who are in favour of Europe are on the defensive, uh, trying to respond uh, to the criticisms. I think, first of all, from the point of view of Northern Ireland, we have to recognise the huge benefits that arise from the European Union from, from our membership. And leaving aside the issue over the financial contributions uh, at a UK level as a whole, Northern Ireland itself uh, gains massively in terms of financial income from Europe, whether it's through the Common Agricultural Policy, whether it's through peace money, whether it's through the structural funds, uh, for example, the European Social Fund, uh, which I helped to run, which invests quite heavily in young people through things like apprenticeships uh, and a lot of schemes through the community and voluntary sector that are helping young people who are disengaged uh, from, from the labour market. Uh, the European Union as well brings a host of other benefits to us in terms of, of trade opportunities, environmental uh, protection. It's brought peace and stability right across the, the European uh, continent. Uh, the European Union is at the forefront of trying to address uh, issues happening beyond our shores in terms of, of Ukraine at present, which are very much uh, in, in, in the news. Uh, it does require reform for sure, but it's important that we engage constructively in terms of that reform. People are talking now about a referendum and a referendum as to whether the UK should leave Europe. Uh, we believe that any referendum should only really be about a decision on additional powers. But to talk about the UK leaving Europe is hugely destabilising for Northern Ireland. Uh, we depend upon a lot of investment coming in here uh, for future jobs. Uh, people come to Northern Ireland because we're English speaking and because we're part of the European Union. And even the talk or threat of us leaving Europe is enough to deter investors from coming here. Indeed, a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Stephen Perry, thank you very much. And uh, our final uh, speaker to set forth uh, their case for you today is Tina McKenzie of NI21. Tina. Yeah. I wore my pink dress for the Giro d'Italia. I hope you like it. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to address quickly something that Ross said. Leave your sectarian divides behind. The wonderful news in Northern Ireland is that most of you don't have that. You know, most young people in Northern Ireland are not carrying the baggage that these old politicians carry. Let's face it, you want a new Northern Ireland, you want a pluralist Northern Ireland, you want a liberal Northern Ireland, and so do I. I'm not a politician, I'm not an elected representative yet. I'm from business, I'm a girl who failed her 11 plus from West Belfast. I also, when I did my A-levels, I decided I loved politics. I did politics and thank God I passed my A-level politics because I liked it, I enjoyed it. And that's what education's about. Education's about finding something you love. The next step to education is about finding a job. If we continue in Northern Ireland with the type of politics we have, what's happening is we are stifling our economy. I know I'm a business person. I worked right across Europe, that girl who failed her 11 plus, and I didn't do well in my GCSEs. I became one of the top directors in the UK and worked globally with the largest companies. So you can achieve anything you want to achieve as long as you put your mind to it. Northern Irish people in business, when we get out of Northern Ireland, we're the best. They always said to me, when do you stop? When do you give up? And I'm like, well, we've got grit in our belly because we've had a hard time in Northern Ireland. So now is the time for young people to throw off the shackles of this old storm and throw out all this orange and green rubbish. Look up to your results that you did. You don't want it. Tell them loud and clear. No matter what they say, we judge them by their actions. And all we hear on television is bang, 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 bang. What about jobs? What about the fact that one in five of you will be unemployed? What about the fact that if you're doing accountancy or even if you're doing uh, law, you're some of the smartest academics, and if you're even doing teaching, you're probably not going to get a job here because we would rather talk about parades, flags, and the past, unless other people get into politics, people like you. Don't think that politics is all what you say in Stormont. Politics is engaging people and telling people like you that you can get involved and you can make a difference. NI21, it stands for Northern Ireland in the 21st century. It's new politics. Thank you. So there we are, folks. Uh, that, those are your candidates. We're going to hear more from them uh, and you get a chance to question them directly and we get a chance to hear from you.
so let's uh, just move on to uh, one of our uh, first uh, topics. Uh, and really, this is a, a section where we want to deal with uh, what does Europe mean uh, to you? We want to examine that. Uh, and I think one of the ways to start off uh, with that is uh, to get you to vote. Okay? So Northern Ireland is part of the European Union. What is the main impact of this membership? Now, hopefully you can see on the screens, uh, the TV screens there, or the screen up above, uh, these are the, the options you have, one to seven. Uh, cultural diversity, economic prosperity, freedom of movement, global influence, human rights, loss of independence, or is it something else? Okay, so those are your seven options. Cultural diversity, economic prosperity, freedom of movement, global influence, human rights, uh, loss of independence, uh, or uh, something else entirely. So between one and seven, uh, if I could all ask you to vote now. Just have to press it once, it'll uh, accept uh, your vote there and then. You don't need to point the thing towards anything, it'll just uh, be registered. Uh, and as soon as the 30 seconds is up, we can uh, give you the results of that poll. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, our number one with 23.5%. Uh, is economic prosperity. So that's what, uh, well, almost a quarter of you think uh, is uh, what is the main impact of European membership. Uh, what do we have after that? Next, we have freedom of movement, obviously a big issue. Uh, nearly one-fifth of you, 19.6%, say freedom of movement is the main impact. Uh, then going down to some of the other uh, popular ones, cultural diversity uh, and human rights uh, are equal uh, there with eight votes each, 15.7%. Uh, loss of independence is a main impact, so a number of you uh, are either concerned about that or recognise that as an issue. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, global influence uh, is an important impact uh, for four people, uh, and uh, around three people, 5.9%, uh, think it's something else entirely. So uh, those uh, are uh, your votes. Uh, I'll get you to respond to some of the, those uh, in a moment. Uh, but uh, let me just go, go to our candidates uh, then. Um, Alex Atwood. Uh, you know, when you look at that vote, does that surprise you, or would it have been the kind of thing you might have said yourself? Uh, sorry, what's the question? The, the results of our poll there, do you, uh, do you basically agree with that, or which one would you have highlighted? Uh, no, I, I think that the vote is the accurate vote. Um, I think that what you're saying is, first of all, if you took a look at the votes for cultural diversity and human rights, that is saying to me that you recognise that our strength is our diversity. That if we end up being... Uh, one community, one tradition, one nationality, and live in isolation, that is, does violence to the scale and opportunities that we have of people across the world. So our diversity is our strength. The European Union reflects that. The American Union reflects that. And that's part of the nature of the world going forward. We need to more and more acknowledge and understand that. And secondly, economic opportunity. It is one of the biggest markets in the world. It is made up of 28 uh, member states. Uh, uh, our biggest trading partner for Northern Ireland is the European Union. And if we were to withdraw from the European Union, the damage that would cause to those who export from our country, to our farmers who are subsidised rightly from the European Union in order to produce quality assured uh, produce that we eat and we export, the damage done to us of all of that and EU withdrawal would be immense. That's why I think you're accurate in saying cultural diversity, uh, economic prosperity, Human rights are part and parcel of the benefit. And the final point is this, freedom of movement. If there's anything that defines the people of this part of the world, it is that at one time or another, we were the immigrant or the stranger. And unfortunately, at this very moment, there are people from our part of the world but who are I immigrants and strangers. I ask you to hold that thought, because we will come to that issue uh, later on. But let's stick with uh, some of those big things there about uh, economics and so on. And uh, Marvin, sorry, I want to come to you. Uh, we heard uh, earlier uh, Phil Fanligan uh, picked up on uh, agriculture. Obviously, it's a huge uh, part of our economy here and suggested that Sinn Féin uh, had uh, voted on an issue, uh, but, uh, but your MEP hadn't. Uh, do you want to respond to that, obviously? I think, too, in relation, let me quote on the economic prosperity. That is a reflection of what the executive has put here as a priority. Why? Because uh, despite the dismissive nature of some of the comments earlier about uh, the older politicians, 
The reality is for us all, we need a stable economy in Northern Ireland. And that has been reflected. And the job announcements over the last two weeks are clearly an indication that something's working. So, you know, we either read the glass half full or half empty. And I think in terms of Northern Ireland, you need to be able to ensure that there is a structure in place which maximises the benefit to have the access to economic prosperity and to job creation. And I think that has been displayed and demonstrated a few weeks ago, uh, or in the last couple of weeks. In terms of the vote at the European Union, yes, we voted against the reduction in the budget for this reason, because the bureaucracy of Europe is astounding. Why have we two parliaments? Because of the treaty. There is billions of euros that are squandered moving the parliament from one location to another. But what we are very clear about is that we are not going to allow a situation to develop, as is being proposed by Phil's minister in regards to farmers, that there are some who are more advantageous and more that you should protect over others. Let me go back to the point and the SDLP is, is in the same position on this issue. The Ulster unions, I don't think, have a position on this issue. And it's clear, the single farm payment is the single biggest issue facing the electorate in this election. Because if we do damage to our farmers, whether they're hill farmers, whether they're low-lying farmers, we will have a huge impact on all our economies because to a lesser or greater degree we all depend upon the agricultural uh, community and the business in Northern Ireland. So that point in terms of the economics vis-a-vis -vis the farming community is a vitally important point. Thank you, uh, Mervyn. Uh, Danny Kennan, do you want to respond to that? Uh, Mervyn says he's not sure whether you have a policy uh, on single farm payment. I think that's quite a disgraceful comment. Um, Jim is out there working on it and the one thing we've never had in agriculture is politics. Farming was a non-political, no green, orange, and one party taking another, and I hate to go into because we're here about Europe today, but just as a short, sharp one, one party taking the other to court and creating a split on the subject doesn't help anyone. It needs everybody sitting down and trying to find a joint way forward. And that's what we should be talking about. If you could concentrate on what's up there, economic prosperity, we should all be concentrating on that and getting jobs for everybody, getting the education system, the training and the skills so that you can all go anywhere in the world and show that Northern Ireland's best and you're part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, Danny, anybody want to come in at this point? Um, you know, you've all voted there. Uh, economic prosperity has topped the poll. Also, freedom of movement was quite high up there. Anybody want to chip in uh, with a thought or anybody you want to hear from? Uh, feel free. Don't be shy. Uh, I'll come back to you, okay? But uh, please, uh, just catch my eye. Anybody want to come in? No? All quiet at the moment. Do you want to come in? Economics? You were talking about economics before. Give us, give us a, a question related to that. Here, you can borrow my mic for a minute. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Um, you all seem to be very um, for economic prosperity, but um, I've been doing research on some of your parties, and um, the main things that come up for like such things as DUP and all those there type of parties is... Um, nothing really to do with the economic side of things. I just want to know like, what you really are um, putting forward for economic prosperity in Northern Ireland. Okay, and uh, do you want to hear from uh, anybody in particular? Just to, to, uh, the, you mentioned the DUP. Did you want to hear from the DUP or the Sinn Féin or the third man? Okay, so the Conservatives are going to get a go here. Okay, Mark. <laughs> Brilliant. I started off at zero. And our, listen to my presentation at the start, I spoke about economic prosperity. That's what the NI Conservatives are about. Yeah, I, yeah, and the fantastic opportunity we have in Northern Ireland is our economy is 70% public and 30% private. And the private sector in Northern Ireland is 98% small to medium-sized enterprises, and 90% of that are micro-businesses. So the world of work you're going to transition into from where you are now, if you stay in Northern Ireland, is to micro-organisations. Northern Ireland is growing. Is, 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 the bedrock of our economy is on SMEs. And as you can see, if, you ask any, if I ask anyone in the room, if you picked a party in the United Kingdom and you talked about the economy, who would you say? Would you say Lib Dem, Labour, or the Conservatives? Anyone? For the economy. Well, not all their, not all their unions, but what disappoints me is I'm here the same as Tina, not as an elected representative yet. And I'm disappointed because I have worked across Europe and globally, 
and return to Northern Ireland because I left Northern Ireland disappointed, probably as you are at the minute, with the political situation that was going on. I've seen a wider culture and a wider prospect. And we absolutely need to develop the economy in Northern Ireland. And for me, going back to the private, we can get that balance. Let's look at a balance from 70, 30 to 60, 40 or 50, 50. Because at the minute, I'm not sure if you're aware, we, sp we spend about 20 billion pounds on the public services. We only self-generate through our private sector about 10.4 billion. We continue to get a handout of 9.6 billion of a block grant from Westminster. We also get from the European Union, the, the allocation now from 2015 to 2020 is 3.5 billion. And we've heard the debate, uh, an ideological inter-party debate about CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy. My concern is, although the single form of payment will benefit farmers due to a 0% transfer from a pillar one to a pillar two, I'm concerned about one of our major industries, which is the agri-food. Agri I don't know where the executive are going to get the extra funding for to fund the go for growth strategy. So it's about economic prosperity, just finishing cultural diversity. I, um, my mother was from West Belfast and my father was from East Belfast. And I absolutely celebrate cultural diversity at every opportunity. And it is about the free movement of, of, of people coming into Northern Ireland. Let me, let me get somebody else in at this point. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, okay, um, I thought there was a bit of disparaging uh, sort of sound coming from uh, Phil Flanagan here at Sinn Féin, so uh, just, uh, <laughs> what, you were uh, disagreeing uh, on some of that. Do you want us to speak sitting down or do you want to get up? Stand up, I think probably stand up from where you are. Yeah. Well, I think one of the fundamental problems with, with the European Union is that it's run by a collective of right-wingers, um, and, and all you hear is how we need to grow the private sector, and the way to grow the private sector is to cut the tax they pay. But what about the small businesses that aren't making money? You know, what about cutting their operating costs? What about cutting energy costs? There's no talk about that. It's all about helping big business. And that's what people like Mark are interested in, is helping big business, even though they, they make up a very small proportion of our economy. It's the only people, people like the Tories are interested in. Do you want to come back in on, on, on any thoughts on that? Do you think the European Union's run by right-wingers? Um, well, to a certain extent, yeah, I think it is. I agree with that. I do think that they do concentrate on like where the big money is um, and things like that. I do, I do believe that they do um, discriminate kind of against the private se or public sector as they think they're an easy target um, and they can take away from them and feed into the big business as well. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, anybody else want to come in at all? Just uh, throw your hand up. Uh, um, I just want to get more people in. Yeah, just. Uh, Give me a microphone here. Tell us who you are and, and, uh, and what you want to say. Uh, I'm Jack from Oak and Derry. Uh, Mr. Atwood mentioned that most of our trade is exports over to the EU. And I was, I'd like to ask Mark, the Conservative, how will you maintain the high trade that we do to the EU, if we do leave the EU? OK, give us a quick one on that, Mark. How do you maintain the trade if you were to think about leaving? Is that what, what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, at the minute, it's a market of 500 million, as we know. And the Conservative Party now have kept the economy growing for five quarters in a row, to 3.6 growth. That puts us in a brilliant position to negotiate with Europe reform. And, and, and let's not be under no illusion here. The reform in Europe is happening as we speak due to austerity. And what happened? So due to the economic and global downturn, Europe has to change. And I'll go back to Phil's comment. Absolute rubbish. I'll tell you why. Europe is focused on the SMEs. And Northern Ireland is focused on the small to medium-sized enterprises. The United Kingdom is focused on SMEs, focused on the micro-business sector. That's where the investment has to go. That's where the jobs come from. Remember, no business starts off big. So we can't get a big business unless we invest in small business. So, and I am an economist, and that's the point I'm coming from. Bill, and I disagree with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, just going to keep moving along here. Uh, Tina, uh, you are saying you're offering something uh, different. What about on the economic front, if that's the issue that is gripping people here today, yeah. thinking about jobs, what's the difference? The difference is, first of all, having a really informed debate. So what you've got in Europe is a social market economy, and it's changing all the time. So if there, you heard these guys talking about cap and agriculture and farmers. We've got about 27,000 farmers in Northern Ireland, OK? It's not really a lot in terms of 1.8 million people. Now, off cap, 
uh, do you mind? Have some manners. Um, off cap, what you'll find is that in the 1980s, the budget of the European Union was about 85% of it was spent on cap. Today, it's only in about 43%. Why is that? It's not because we don't appreciate farmers and agriculture, it's because the world is changing. It's in the name 21st century. So we have a knowledge-based economy, and it's not about whether only small business or big business is good, about whether the public sector versus the private sector is right. It's about ensuring we've got the right balance of all of those things. So we need big companies because big companies actually bring a lot of innovation. They've got a lot of money to offer a lot of research. So if you look at GlaxoSmithKline, if you look at some of the uh, recent inventions that we're getting, especially against cancer and things like that. We do need big companies, but equally, especially in Northern Ireland, we, meet, we need so much more help with our SMEs. And you, the employees of the very near future, have to probably get your heads around the fact that you've gone through school and you've had academic qualifications. And when you get into the world of work, and I know about it because I've worked in the world of work for 20 years, it's going to be more about things like your resilience, your attitude to work how you are with other people, your ability to build a team. All of those things are way more important, actually, than specific academic results. On top of that, we need innovation. So if I look across the other European countries, what they're doing really well, they're training people like you to be in school and be more innovative, be more entrepreneurial, and allow you the freedom to do that and not box you into specific academic curriculums. So we've got a lot of opportunity in Northern Ireland to change our education system, and we've got to do that because, guess, what? I don't mean to be negative, but we're a little bit behind the ball here. A lot of other countries are a wee bit ahead of us in, in linking the education system, the qualifications, with what the world of work looks like, not just today, but what it's going to look like in the next 20, 30 years. 80 million more people every single year. We know we've got scarcity in skills. We're not matching up with it. I could go on, but I won't bore you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We may come back actually to the skills issue. So I don't want to go too specific on it. And I know it's, it's obviously something that you could talk about, uh, Stephen Barry. Uh, but just in the general wider point then, uh, taking the two headlines there, I suppose the economy and freedom of movement, um, do you agree with, with our voters here that, that those are the big issues? Well, in many respects, the two go hand in hand. Um, I mean, freedom of movement uh, means both for freedom of labour, uh, and that means people, and the importance of people seeing themselves both having an identity from their region of Northern Ireland, uh, whether and also their country, UK or Ireland, and also being pro-European and being part, part of Europe. I mean, part of that wider community where people are open, they get on with each other, and that they see a real common purpose in terms of what is a very difficult and challenging world. It also means freedom of movement in terms of, of goods, and we benefit hugely from being part of that single market. And if we were to leave the European Union, people talk about, well, we can, we can do the same trade deals. Well, that adds just more and more bureaucracy and complication, and in practice will put in place many, many more barriers. If I maybe could address the issue of skills and actually talk about the practical things that we do have to do in, in Northern Ireland, if we look, we need to, do, to be investing a lot more in apprenticeships uh, because they are very much about in-work training uh, and people will be gaining skills that they know that employers like. And if we look around the European Union, and this is where we can actually learn positive lessons, it's those countries that invest most in apprenticeships and, and youth training, such as the Scandinavian countries, Germany and uh, Switzerland and, and Austria, that have the lowest levels of youth unemployment. So there's a real clear lesson for us in that regard. Also, whenever we look at research, there's currently a, a, a program that's just been launched called Horizon 2020, which has something like 70 billion pounds, or sorry, 70 billion euros um, of research uh, money available for either local companies or for our local universities to access. We haven't done as well to it as we could have done. We've now put in place a new infrastructure to make sure we can, we're much more competitive in drawing down those bids. But on the back of that, there's huge potential. The jobs can come from Europe, but it's important that we engage with Europe to get the jobs. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And just we'll have a final word, uh, and uh, just to say to the candidates, I'm not necessarily going to come to everybody on every topic, but since we're doing it with this first one, I think uh, only fair, uh, Ross, to hear from the Green Party. Uh, do you agree with our voters on these big issues, uh, and, and what do you take from that vote? Well, I just want to touch on some of the, the, the things that have been discussed, and I think from our perspective, what we're seeing is a Europe that is controlled and driven by a corporate agenda, and an agenda where profit is, is making the, the decisions. And I think that this is where we differ from a, a lot of the parties here on, on the panel, because at the moment, Europe is controlled by right-wing parties, parties who are in favour of the free market, who are in favour of deregulation, who are in favour of big businesses, and we're standing up here and we're challenging that as a party. And I think this is the biggest discussion we ought to be having here today. Um, 
in terms of in terms of the whole question of agriculture, to bring this to relate this question to agriculture, we opposed the reform of the common agricultural policy because it didn't actually change the fact that we have 80% of our subsidies are going to 20% of our farmers. It's the corporate agricultural giants are the ones that benefit from agriculture, not the small family farmers. And to also finish off with the whole question of, 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 of economics, at the moment, probably the biggest issue that is going on in Europe is a negotiation on a free trade agreement between the EU and the US. That is currently being negotiated. It's being negotiated behind closed doors, and there's very little that has been publicized about that. But the big concern is, the big concern is, is that we are actually going to move in a, in a position where our social, environmental, and food standards are actually lowered to match those in the US, to open our market up with the US. And again, this is something we are challenging because Europe isn't just all about the economy. It's about everything that relates to well-being as well. So social, your, your, social and, uh, your social side and the environmental side is also very important. And one thing to very, to very finish, off with, to finish off with, and I think the whole question of free movement and cultural diversity is what uh, Europe is, is built on as well. It's a pluralist democracy, and it's, an, it's in opposition to this whole concept of nationalism, whether it's British, Irish, French, German, Russian, whatever. Europe is an is a, a international framework that transcends nationalism that has held this country back, and that's what we need to do if we want to move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, folks, thank you very much for uh, covering that first issue for us about what are the main impacts from Europe. What does Europe mean uh, to us here? We've got a, a flavour of it. We've got a sense from our voters uh, as to what are the big issues uh, for them. Uh, and thank you to those who asked questions. And I'm looking for, for some new ones now as we go on through. So please get your questions ready for our politicians. Uh, that's what we're here for today. Now, our next topic is uh, about inclusiveness and integration. Uh, and uh, to kick this off, uh, I want uh, to show you a video, and then after the video, uh, we'll explain a little bit more about it. We'll hear from Stephen and from, from Amy just afterwards, maybe. Uh, you can tell us a little bit about the whole uh, project. Uh, and uh, the video is uh, called Human Eyes. Human Eyes. Let's have a look. darüber nach, denn Vorurteile schließen Menschen aus. There we are, human eyes, yep. Another round of applause. So, uh, Stephen and Amy here were involved in the project. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Human Eyes. Maybe you want to stand up and um, I'll hand you the microphone. You can share it here and tell us what it's all about, what you've been up to. Um, well, basically, the video that you just watched is um, showing you how... Um, Looking at somebody, you cannot tell like what kind of background they're from. I mean, like one of the questions said, who's the, uh, or who's the university graduate? You can't tell from looking at those who is and who isn't. 
Um, so the Human Eyes project me and Stephen first got involved in was back last Easter and um, we gave up our Easter holidays and um, students from our youth from Romania, Berlin, Hamburg and people from our own school Hazelwood all got together and got involved in this project. Um, basically the project is all about trying to exclude um, the inappropriate labelling and stereotypes of those based on their ethnic or ethnic religion or any sort of racial slurs towards people, which anybody who has been watching the news will know recently with Jeremy Clarkson and the BBC. Um, so over the week we've done uh, various activities and we got to make four videos and that was one of the videos that was created and it was each group made their own video so there is a Hazelwood video, a Romanian video, a Berlin and a Hamburg video and I'm not too sure which one that is but it's, um, it's one of them and we got the opportunity to go to the EU in Brussels and we got to go to a grassroots conference and we got to show the four videos to 100 people from eight different countries. And we also got to show the video to the Vice President of the Economic and Social Committee, Jane Morris, as well. Um, basically, if you have any interest, we do have a Facebook page, uh, Humanize 13. And you can also go on to our Vimeo page from there and you can also see the other videos. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen and Amy there from uh, Hazelwood. Thank you for uh, telling us about that. Um, and uh, it is it is obviously an issue which is in the news uh, recently for all sorts of reasons. Locally, we've had uh, some uh, a whole spate of attacks uh, on uh, immigrant workers in Belfast. Uh, we've also uh, seen issues with sport in the US with the famous uh, uh, NBA, NBA uh, owner having to uh, basically sell uh, the club because uh, he made uh, racist, racist remarks. We've had the Jeremy Clarkson remarks. Uh, so it is, it is a subject that uh, is very much alive, unfortunately, uh, and uh, one that uh, I suppose we have to deal with. So the vote we want uh, to ask you here and the question uh, we want uh, to kick this off is in relation, obviously, to Europe. So has Northern Ireland's membership of the European Union helped to make Northern Ireland a more inclusive society? So what do you think? Has it helped? make Northern Ireland more inclusive. And the options are one for yes, two for no, three for don't know or no opinion. So everybody get ready to vote now. And our results are in. Yes, 53% think it has made Northern Ireland more inclusive. 28% uh, say it hasn't. Uh, and 19% aren't sure, don't have any particular opinion. Uh, Alex Atwood, we have had some pretty nasty attacks recently in Belfast. Uh, you know, that is as a result of the fact that people have freedom of movement, are able to come and work here. Uh, but it hasn't changed people's attitudes in some cases towards them. Has it, so how could we argue, as 53% say, uh, that uh, EU membership has made us more inclusive? Because I think that if you ask the 53% in this room, they would say that uh, because of EU membership, because of the 28 member states, because of the diversity of its people, because of the number of nation states that there are, because the languages and the colours and that mix that makes up the European Union, I think that has in fact and informed how we see ourselves that consequently we do not look in the round at other people as alien or foreign. Some people but, do, clearly. Yeah, yes, so. but, but the 53%, the I think, are right to say that we are more inclusive because we've become more respectful, more tolerant, uh, uh, more committed to equality and fairness. But the 28% are also right because whilst we have learned a lot in terms of respect, it's clear that when it comes to the nature of our society, be it in terms of those who are immigrants or in terms of those who are neighbours who were born here, um, there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of integration. I live in a constituency. Uh, we live in a city where there are 17 or 18 walls that divide the people. 
that is a symbol of the fact that we have yet more to do in terms of making our society inclusive. But if you judge it against our history, we are more inclusive and more equal than we were, and that Europe has contributed in order to bring about that culture change. Is there a mountain of work to be done? Clearly there is. That's why answers one and two are both right. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan again, uh, what do you think? I agree entirely with what Alex has just said about both being right, but um, I've recently been chair of the all-party group here on ethnic minorities, and in that one point, I think it's 1.6 billion is brought into Northern Ireland by immigrants coming here and working in their skills, and we should also be aware that both Harland and Wolf were both immigrants that came to Northern Ireland, so we've traditionally been a country that has welcomed people, but what Alex said it's both sides. We have always, in Europe, you've got to find the balance. It's encouraging us to learn about each other's differences, accept them, and all working together at the same time as doing the same here in Northern Ireland and pulling it all together. Since I came home in 1984, Northern Ireland's changed phenomenally, and that's what we want to see happening in the future. Thank you very much. Anybody want to come in? Uh, any of our uh, people who voted there, any of our young people want to contribute on this at all? Just uh, give me a shot. Yep, uh, Stephen there. Do you want to? Thanks. <clears throat> Um, I believe it was recently in the Belfast Telegraph that um, they're now saying that uh, Belfast is slowly becoming the racy capital of the UK. And I was wondering, um, whoever wants to come in on the question, um, how you think that there portrays Belfast to other European countries? Yeah, OK. Uh, what do you think about all these attacks we've had recently? Um, anyone want to come in on that? Uh, Tina, um, why is it we've got, and, and even... Uh, None of the people here, but we had comments from, from uh, I think, uh, one of the MLAs here at Stormont who seemed to almost, you know, condone some of the actions that have taken place, say, in East Belfast. Yeah. I think partly our bigger, well, our, our, our society is already coming from a divided situation. And although, you know, some of the comments, we've come a long way and we need to be grateful for how far we've come, well, we haven't come far enough. And the situation is that unless you're kind of maybe living in a nice middle-class area. You're probably going to be segregated in Northern Ireland. 90% of people are in uh, religious areas, and therefore, and, and we're here to talk about education, therefore there's not much chance of them having the opportunities to go to um, schools where there's a cross community. So we have to face the facts of where we are, and if you're in a society where people are already divided, and it already is a fearful society, you know, you all, you're all smart, you all already know that we've got problems here. And therefore, when you put on top of that other types of people from other places, then that just gets exaggerated. So Northern Ireland is not a very nice, welcoming place for people coming from other places. Now, it doesn't mean that we're all racist, because certainly we're not, but it just means that we've got to work extra hard at ensuring that we don't fall backwards because of already the low base that we're coming from in terms of a divided society. We often hear our politicians saying, and I've heard quite a lot of uh, even the leaders of political parties saying that they'd like to see more integrated education. And I laugh to myself because I think that's all well and good, but you guys can't even work together. Never mind tell our kids to go and get integrated. <laughs> Isn't that the case? You know, thank you. Thanks, sir. Yeah, okay, let me put that point uh, to one of the main parties, uh, and then I'll come to a couple of others who want to come in. Phil Flanagan, is the fact that, that we've already got this divided society adding to our problems then when we have uh, add an extra layer to do with, say, immigrant workers? Well, I think one of the big problems we have is that in our society we have tar far too many racists, we have tar far too many people that are sectarian, we have too many homophobes, we have too many xenophobes, we have too many bigots, and, and we all need to deal with that collectively. I think as, as politicians we need to show leadership and, and challenge people that, that have such outdated um, beliefs. Um, I don't think they're, they're acceptable at any time, and they're certainly not acceptable in the 21st century um, in the modern world. Um, in terms of, of whether um, being a, a part of the European Union has, has helped um, bring us towards a more inclusive society. I think it has, but I think also um, things like the media, the fact that you can now go around the world in a single day and that people travel more has also helped. So I think just the fact that the time's moving um, has made us a more inclusive society, but unfortunately there are some people that aren't coming with us um, and it is a difficult job um, to try and get those people on board. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, uh, Ross, what do you make of it? Uh, I think that this is a serious problem and I really 
um, a really depressing problem as well. Um, and I think that one of the, the, the reasons that we're starting to see this in many ways is, a, is insecurity within our communities, underlying um, much of, of intolerance and, uh, and sectarianism and racism, uh, is, is genuine concerns about things like services and, and jobs and uh, health uh, provision and education. And I think that at a time when we're seeing all those things cut and where people are finding it particularly hard with the cost of living and really trying to make ends meet, um, and they're not getting the services that they, they, they deserve. They, they, you know, you've got the likes of, of UKIP who are, have come in and said, these are the people who are to blame. And, and that's not right, but at the same time, we need to, to deal with the underlying problems as well. Um, I want to say a few things about the, the myths of, 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 of migration, because this is, uh, as I say, is often uh, what you hear out there in, in the media. And actually, EU migrants contribute more than they take out in benefits or, or services in taxes. And my dad said to me one time, actually, he said, you know, and I don't think he's intolerant, I don't think he's racist at all, but he said, you know, I can understand why people are concerned, because people are coming in and they're taking these jobs and blah, blah, blah. And I said, and I said, Dad, where's your son? And he looked at me and I said, he's in Spain. Spain, a country with 40% unemployment, and he's taking somebody's job. You know, he's out working in there as a DJ, and he has the right to do that, just like other people, and just like the million other people in the UK who live in Spain. They have the right to be there, just like other people have to be here. I agree with the whole point on integration, but I do think that Europe is actually helping to make us a more tolerant society, and I very much hope it is, because it gives us the opportunity to go live abroad and come back again, and, and vice versa, and, and integrate with each other, and particularly with like the study abroad Erasmus opportunities that it offers. So your, your brother's DJ in Spain, then. So you get to stay here, and he gets to go. <laughs> um, I'll just I'll come up the, the line here, but I just want to I'll get to Stephen Farian since I'm right beside him here at the moment. Why is it that people often pick up on the negatives then to do with immigration? It is them taking our jobs, not adding to the economy. Well, maybe let's put it in positive terms for for a moment, and building on the point there Ross made uh, around the fact that they're net contributors to the economy. Let's look at our health service, for example. Uh, if it wasn't for, for example, Filipino and Indian nurses, our health system in Northern Ireland would utterly collapse. So we are entirely dependent upon labour coming in from elsewhere around us. The issue about competition for jobs is also a complete myth. The challenge for us is actually to invest in those people who don't have the skills at present, uh, who are disengaged from the labour market, to get them re-engaged, to get them re-skilled, to, to enable them uh, to, to access employment. We're not talking here about a zero sum that people are, are, are fighting over. We should actually be positive and say that actually the fact that people want to come in North, to, to live and work in Northern Ireland is actually a reflection of our society and a positive reflection that we actually are somewhere that's actually worth coming to, to work. So let's celebrate that and build upon that. For those people, and they are like a minority in our society who, who are engaged in racial attacks and also sectarian attacks, the law is there. To, to address that. This is not a situation where we have to make excuses for them. The law is there and the law has to be enforced in that regard. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen Mervyn. I mean, just coming back to this point about uh, we'll have a, a divided system here, even of government, which recognises you can have uh, a petition of concern to mean that a vote basically gets taken depending on whether it's orange or green. Uh, does that contribute to the fact that if we can't you know, get along as orange and green, then we're hardly likely to get along with some other colours who come here as well? Well, I, I think that we have to always say it, what, what, the, the views that we have in the context. We have to deal with reality. It's all very fine. Some people have come here today and been very dramatic and dismissing everything. You know, we have to live in the real world. The reality is that there are parties here who in the past have supported and justified acts of terrorism. That's a reality. That's a fact. You can try and hide it. You can try and deny it. But that, now, I find it somewhat ironic that, you know, one, Phil has said here today, we have to, we're talking about an inclusive society, so we all have to be inclusive. However, he's saying that there's outdated beliefs that have to go. Where's the inclusivity there? You know, it, it sometimes does come down to, let's face certain facts. And yes, we have to have petitions of concern. Why? Because while we have come a distance, there is still uncertainty, there is still fear, there is still suspicion, and there are still issues that we have to deal with in a way which gives confidence. Now, I hope the day comes when we don't have petitions of concern. In fact, I hope the day... Petition of concern is where we can ensure that there has to be 30 or more members of the Assembly can block any particular piece of legislation which comes before the Assembly. And it means that it has to be a cross-community vote. It has to be a majority of each of 
the community voting in the assembly. Now, I think that what we have to do is if we have come that journey, and the European Union to a degree has helped us in terms of accepting others, we have to start by accepting ourselves. Because in Northern Ireland, we have lived apart. I was brought up in a village. Let me make this point. I've come a long way in a journey. I was brought up in a village that was 60% 60 nationalist and 40% unionist. When myself and my best friend, who was Roman Catholic, when we came to go to school, he went to St. Olkins, I went to Armway Primary. That's still the same today. The reality is people, people vote in surveys. 80% of people say, wonderful aspiration, integrated education. Okay, send your, your child to an integrated school. No, no, only 4% do. So it's not, it's not that it's not there. It is there, but people make choices. So we're going to dismiss all those people and say they're just homophobic, they're sectarian, they're racist. I don't think that's the case. We sometimes make the issue very simplistic. Okay, thank you, Reverend. And a quick word, Mark. Just a quick word. I want to be, I want to be very simplistic. Sorry. Is it for you there? Here we are again. We're meant to be talking about a question on Europe. Has our European membership benefited us in terms of cultural diversity and respect for others? And we're into the dungeons again of orange and green. It, it, it continues to disturb me. I'll tell you why. I think whenever I was your age, which is a long time ago, um, that would be reversed. Going back to my point where my mom was from West Belfast and my father was from the east of the city, I remember living in a unionist community. And I remember my mother having to hide her culture. She used to hide her rosary beads in her purse for fear, for fear of discrimination. And both myself and my three brothers made a conscious decision to leave Northern Ireland exactly for that reason. So putting a positive spin back on things, we still have a long way to go. But I think that, yes, the, 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 the European Union membership that we have is having a positive effect and I would commend all of you young people to continue to work on the yeses. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Mark. Just a, a quick couple of comments here. I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, here we go. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, Mark, you pointed out rightly, and I, I do want to stick to the question. Um, I, Mervyn, you managed to get back to orange and green issues there. And well, sorry, this is one of the things you said. Is, you said there's still discrimination, suspicion, and fear. And just quickly, I'd like to hear back from you. It's, it's members of your party go down to Toledo and sit up on a platform and perpetrate the zero-sum game where if someone's winning, you're are all losing. And you are part of the problem, and so are your politicians. Okay, that's what uh, I want to say. I'll come, I'll come back to you in a minute, Marvin, on that. I'm gonna, I, want to, I want to pull in a few comments, and then, and then I'll come back to our, our candidates. Thank you. I just want to say, whenever me and Stephen were in Brussels, um, we were we had like a debate about like integrated education in Europe, and what we discovered was actually Northern Ireland is one of the most forward countries with integrated education because different countries were coming off with things like, oh maybe we should get buses to go into schools to take kids to school. Like this is the things that were coming, and they were asking, they were talking to us and asking us about integrated education and how it works here. And it's actually, it does, it was work, it works, and we find it very strange that we actually are one of the most forward countries with integrated education. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, yeah, I'm going to come round here. I'll come round to to you guys in a minute. There's a couple here. Yep. Um. Uh, I just wanted to just try there. How people don't actually think they should come here. Um, I think it's important to point out that they're not actually stealing our jobs, but rather doing the jobs that we don't actually want to do. And in saying that, as in regards to taking the jobs, taking the money in 1999 to 2000, they contributed 20, no, they took sorry, 29 million, but added 32. So in saying that, they actually added 3 million to our economy in 1990. Yes. Sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, Mark, I just want to come. I want to come back. Let uh, other, uh, and then we'll come back to. Okay, just just to sort of uh, make sure everybody gets. Is there anybody else here? Just wanted while I'm moving around here. Yep. Yeah. Grab the microphone there. And, uh, <clears throat> I, I'd like to say I completely agree with the integrated education, but I would love to know what some of the politicians would want to do to further encourage it because there's only 62 integrated schools in Northern Ireland. So I'd love to know what they'd want to do to push more so it's wider available. You know, it's only available to certain parts. Okay, uh, thanks. So there was a couple of people who wanted to come in here. Yep. I just wanted to ask you, you're saying you wanted to bring forward integrated education in Northern Ireland, but you actually can't get on as different MPs from different parties. So, how can you bring integration when you can't integrate yourselves? 
Thank you very much. Um, and, and finally, I think there was somebody else just on here. Did you want to, anybody else want to come in? Yeah? I'll, I'll pass the microphone. There's one here and then I'll pass it on to you, okay? Um, I just want to add to what Zoe said. You somebody mentioned about integrated education. Not a lot of parents send their um, children to integrated schools. But how do you expect parents to want to send their children to integrated schools when the majority of politicians won't support integrated education? My point was actually quite similar again. Um, it was basically about, I don't understand how you are like, obviously you are here to argue and give your points of view, but like if you are standing up there laughing at another person who's made a point and then like I understand the arguments, but to laugh at somebody and we're supposed to see you as an example and put you as, to make decisions for us, um, how are we supposed to do that as see you as, as role models or to look up to you when you are sitting having no manners at all listening to someone who's making a point and as for the integrated education why aren't you like looking for new ways why aren't you looking to Europe if this is what we're supposed to be, feel inclus or inclusive with why aren't you looking to them for new ideas thanks very much okay um, I'll just come back, I think, uh, uh, to the two main parties, first of all, DUP and Sinn Féin, I think, need to respond, because uh, we're getting a lot of people asking about integrated education there, and, and also linking it, as, as we did, I suppose, from the question. You know, it, it is a factor in inclusiveness. If we can't be inclusive properly together, how do we expect to, to really be inclusive and welcoming of other uh, cultures? Well, you see, at the expense of going back to the orange and green, let me answer the issue about Twidale. The reason why my colleagues are at Twidale is because if we're not at Twidale, we're accused of abandoning our community. If we go to Twidale, we're accused of aligning ourselves with sectarian uh, politics. So, you know, we have to ask the question, why did Twidale happen in the first place? Why were, are there people who cannot accept the expression of another culture and another tradition? I think that's the answer in relation to Twidale. Integrated education. And, and the, the point was made about, you know, we are not integrated. The fact is, it is a huge step for Northern Ireland to have an all-inclusive executive. Let's remember, I was brought up in an area where it was not seen to be, nor was it desired, to have a all-party inclusive executive. So we have become integrated in that sense. But let's look at who it is that controls our educational system. And it'll, this will be interpreted as a sectarian point. So I'll put my hands up and be accused of that and guilty of it before I say it. Let's ask the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church, are they up for the debate who, who have control of 50% of the schools in Northern Ireland? Are they up for the debate about integrated education? Then if they say yes to that, then this executive has made it very clear that they will ensure that the processes are put in place, whether it's through shared campuses, shared education. Remember, there's a, 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 a requirement on the Department of Education to facilitate and to promote integrated education. That's not been removed. So the, the fact is it's up to those others as well, not just the politician. And we're a fair game to take it on the chin. But there's others who have a responsibility to step up to the plate and say, we're up for this debate. I would like you to ask them and others. You ask me. We've put, made our position clear in terms. Peter Robinson was lambasted when he made his Castlereagh speech. He was accused of attacking the Catholic Church. He was accused of being sectarian when he said we need a single educational system. I don't think my party leader can be any clearer than he's been. And he's, he's not saying it for convenience. He does say it from conviction. Okay, can I ask you to share the microphone with uh, so, at the, same, at the same time. At the same time. Do you want to respond to a couple of things that Mervyn has said? Firstly, he says that if they didn't go to Twadell, they'd be accused of, of ignoring their people. What, what they could do is go to Twadell and stop winding up the people. Members of the UUP could not go to Twadell and tell Richard Haas to go home. The two parties could go to Twadell and tell the people that are there at an interface to go home themselves. It would make far more sense. perhaps take their voter base from, from Catholics uh, doing about that? Well, in, in terms of, of the education system, um, Sinn Féin have attempted on several occasions to bring forward an education and skills authority, a single management authority um, and a single system to run all of the schools. But unfortunately, that's been opposed by Mervyn and the DUP. All of the, the management authorities have bought into it. They all support it. In fairness to Danny Kinahan, he's actually helped them as well. 
um, he, he led the campaign to oppose ESA, and it would have been the, the single most important step we need to get a single education system. With regards to shared education, I think it's something that, that we all support. Um, I don't think our community is fully behind forcing everybody into integrated education. We're going in small steps. Organisations like the Fermanagh Trust in my own area have played a crucial role in that. But in, in, in terms of the future makeup of education, uh, Mervyn talks about Peter Robinson's Castle Ray speech as if it was some defining moment in the future of education. But what's going to happen here on Tuesday? The DUP is bringing a motion not calling for a single education system, not calling for the establishment of a single education managing authority, but looking for the establishment of another governing body to look after controlled schools, similar to the CCMS, so we'd have another organisation that would have a veto on any potential progress in the future in this matter. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm not going to come to the rest just yet, but I will come back on the next uh, issue, uh, just because time's against us. We ran over a little bit on that issue, but uh, you can see... It's I mean, obviously probably given the fact that where a number of our pupils are coming from, it's uh, something they're very interested in. So thank you very much for all uh, contributing to that and, and uh, for addressing those issues. And interesting, I think, too, that it's been linked to the wider issue within Europe that uh, inclusiveness is something, I suppose, that begins at home. Uh, so let's move on uh, to uh, another topic. We'll rattle through a couple of questions here, uh, because, uh, but these are important ones. And uh, this issue really is about jobs and skills, something I suppose that many of you are, are, are starting to think about uh, in, in some detail. Uh, and uh, we want to take a vote, uh, which perhaps links on with what we've just been talking about as well. And it's where do you see your long-term future? Uh, so where do you see your long-term future? Is it in Northern Ireland? Great Britain uh, and the Republic, uh, other European member states, US or Canada, Australia or New Zealand, or somewhere else entirely. So do you hope to see your long-term future here in Northern Ireland, Great Britain, the Republic of Ireland, or any of the other options there? One to seven, uh, if you could get ready to vote, and if you could start voting now, please. <laughs> Well, there we have it. Uh, still the majority hoping uh, that their long-term future will be here in Northern Ireland. 37%, uh, 21%. A fifth of you are thinking it will be uh, across the water in Great Britain. Uh, 9% uh, are planning perhaps uh, to move uh, down south. And a, a similar percentage, the same percentage uh, in other European member states. Interestingly, a uh, slightly higher number there, uh, thinking uh, across the Atlantic to the US and Canada. Uh, two, uh, 5% right around the other end of the world, uh, and then a few of you are thinking uh, somewhere else. But uh, if we strip that back, uh, it is the majority answer, but it is still a minority of the people here. It's uh, almost down to a third of the people here are thinking they will stay here. I want, uh, Stephen Farry, just if you could address that. Uh, is that healthy or positive, or is that a negative? Well, I, I think it, I, I'm slightly encouraged in that it's maybe better than I had feared at one stage, uh, but it is still a negative and it shows that there's still a lot of work to do in this regard. Uh, hopefully we are investing in a local economy and, and creating opportunities for people to build their career here in Northern Ireland. And I mean, I'm responsible for uh, universities and uh, further education colleges and apprenticeships. And I suppose it's just on the subject of integration, so we're stressing the point that our universities and colleges are fully integrated, which shows actually what we can achieve and what actually is possible in Northern Ireland in terms of integrated education. Some of the things we are doing, we're expanding our local uh, university places, particularly in STEM subjects. We're expanding postgraduate post -graduate opportunities in terms of PhDs, where we're doubling the, the number of PhDs we're going to support. We're investing in research. We're about to launch a new system of apprenticeships, including um, higher level apprenticeships, where people can do essentially the equivalent of a university degree in the world of work. Jobs are being created, and hopefully over the next um, 15 years, we're going to create about 30,000 jobs. If we get a lower level of cooperation tax, we'll hopefully double that to about 60,000 jobs. So there's a wealth of opportunities coming here. Most of those will be at higher skill levels, particularly in some sectors such as ICT, the creative industries, agri-food engineering. So we know where the jobs are going to be and I would encourage people to stay here and build their futures in this, in this society. Thanks uh, very much, Stephen. Anybody want to come in, by the way? Anybody perhaps who's voted uh, there saying that they're likely to be leaving uh, here or that's where they see their long-term future? Anybody want to, to come in and tell us a bit more on that? Uh, feel free just to... Uh, uh, no, all shaking your hands, maybe. Maybe you want to say something? Just, just give us a flavour of why, why maybe you voted uh, in the way you did. 
Um, I want to be a teacher when I grow up. And sadly, every teacher that I've asked says that if you want a job in teaching now, that you have to go to another country. And I find that very sad because my family are here. And I think that if I want a job in teaching, that I should um, at least have an opinion and a chance to get a job over here, you know, instead of having to go to another country that I might not want to do. So I was just wondering your opinions on that. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, who, who wants to come in on that one in relation to uh, Danny Cannon? <clears throat> Thank you. I think, I think there's a, a balance we've always got to find of those of you that want to stay here and those of you that want to go and travel. But what we've got to do is make sure that you all end up with the skills so that you can go anywhere. And what we equally need to do is stop people being afraid of going somewhere else. Northern Ireland was leading the world in the last century. We want to get it there in the future. If you've gone off to Australia, set up your own business and you're from here, we should be keeping our claws in you. We should be sending people out to work with you. So you come home, you come home with the new ideas and you pick those ideas up from the world all around. That's what we're not doing. But at the same time here, we've got to create the jobs and it's a mixture of the two. Okay, thanks, Danny. Um, uh, Alex Atwood. The, the, the other startling figure up there is that if you add together all the numbers of those who think that their future long term is outside these islands. It's nearly a third of the people who voted. A third of the people in this room are saying that they think the future is somewhere outside these islands. And that goes back to the, the earlier point, uh, this sense of being let down and fed up with our politics. And all of you who express those views, all of you are right. All of you are right because the mood universally across Northern Ireland, in every city, in every county, is to be let down and to be fed up. The issue is, do we have within ourselves, as a community, as citizens, as politicians, to recreate that hope and ambition and change that did bring about, and people should remember this, that did bring about a level of transformation in this part of the world that we hadn't seen for decades, if not for longer. A new beginning to policing, the acceptance of democracy by other people, and so on. Can I just make one other point about integration? Um, my children go to a state school. So I uh, come from the Catholic faith. I am a democratic republican, and I'm proud to be a democratic Republican, a republican because I think that can serve people very well. But my children go to a state school. Uh, which happens not to be integrated, but is, if you like, organically integrated, because it is Protestant and Catholic, it is mixed race, it has mixed uh, social, econ uh, social and economic background, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. The way forward is, yes, integration, but it is also shared schools, shared sites, and it is people like me sending our children to the best school because we want our children to stay here have the best education, have the best opportunity, and not end up in categories four, five, six, and, and others who are thinking we might well get out of here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Alex. But Mark, I mean, is it necessarily a bad thing? I mean, one of the earlier questions was one of the main impacts, if not advantages, of European human membership was freedom of movement. You've availed of, of that yourself, you said, by, by working elsewhere. Uh, and uh, so was it, is it necessarily a bad thing that a lot of people want to maybe move somewhere else? No, absolutely not. I think it, it really broadens your horizon and what it does, it, it facilitates opportunity for you just to go over to, you've got uh, UK mainland, go there or, or over in, in, into Europe. What we need to do is then enhance language skills as well, which will again strengthen that opportunity for you to do that. But what we're calling on is, going back to my point, my opening point, it's about economic prosperity and, and growth in the economy for Northern Ireland. And that's what we want to do. We want, we want to develop the private sector. We mentioned probably private sector earlier. So if we do that, we create more jobs. And what we need to do though is listen to, listen to the world of work. We need to listen to employers. We need to listen to companies who are thinking about investing in Northern Ireland, who will provide jobs for each and every one of you. But what we we'll have to do, and it was one of my points at the very start, we need to succinctly align our curriculum and our skills development with the requirements of the jobs that are out there. If you were going to do that, though, you'd be saying to the young lad there who wants to do teaching, yes. forget about it. 
No, I'm not. What I'd say to you is to consider not just teaching. When you talk about teaching, you've got the primary sector, the secondary sector, and you've got further and higher education, which the minister is, is leading um, quite eloquently at the minute. I, I would like to support, and I have to be there because that's where I work at the minute, but I have to say that I have been involved in some really innovative initiatives where you've got um, FDI companies coming in, and they're challenging further and higher education to bespokely design a course that lasts nine weeks and you're getting young graduates and undergrads going into that really high intense tempo of upskilling and getting a job at 25 to, to 28 thousand pounds after that so going back to your point enrich yourself go away celebrate cultural diversity go and explore other areas bring the skill sets and bring your innovation bring your entrepreneurial skills back to northern ireland please okay so <laughs> um, so I suppose it's, but the, the, the question I suppose, the sting in the tail there, the question is about long term future, so it's not, that's implying that people wouldn't be coming back. Uh, Ross, what, do you, what have you got to say about those results? Well, I, I want to echo what, what Mark said, because I mean, myself, I had the opportunity to go and live in London and, and spend a, a bit of time in America as well, and I ended up coming back because I realised how great Northern Ireland is, um, but definitely I couldn't uh, emphasise it enough, get out there and, and explore the world, and, and it, it is a big world, and you know, that, that's, it's fantastic that we have these, these freedoms. Um, a couple of other points in terms of the whole question of, of integrated education, and I think that underlying this whole um, this whole debate is is a, is a principled argument is whether the state whether the the state should be funding any particular religion or re interpretation of religion with public taxpayers money because we've got a multi-faith and a non-faith society it's not just even a catholic and protestant there's so many different beliefs out there and just because you're born into a particular family with a particular background doesn't even mean to say that you have those beliefs of, of your of your parents so i think that whole principle of whether i personally um, and, and uh, the party's position is, is that actually um we should be going along the lines of, of the way france and america have their education systems which are, are completely secular that, that they they teach religious education but not religious instruction but on the on the question of of long-term future, it's not necessarily a bad thing either to be able to go away um, and, and to finish it off with the, 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 the teaching um, question. I had something to say about that as well. I'm just trying to remember what it was. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what it was. I can't add something. Oh, yeah, uh, no, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. Is that okay? Yeah. No problem. Katie, do you want to say anything about uh, just our, our, our results of that poll there? Yeah, again, I think it's really important to be really honest with the electorate. And maybe because we're not a party, we don't have a lot, of, or well, we are a party, but we haven't went to the polls yet. So maybe we can be a bit more honest with people. So I don't think it's about religion at all, actually, in fact. And if I look at, I, I lived and worked in GB, um, and if I look at this, the education system there, a lot of my friends moved to certain areas of the country just to get their kids into Catholic schools, believe it or not, even when they weren't Catholic. And what, what happens is, in what, what's called ethos-based education, and we know from, again, right across Europe, the statistics are much better, in fact, in terms of the results. So what you've heard probably recently on the news is some of the state schools in some particular areas, probably Mervyn, that your party represents. Some of our boys in Protestant schools are doing really terribly, uh, not very well. So what we've got to do is not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's definitely look at more uh, uh, integrated education but at the same time, we've got to have a plan. And we need to look at the way that our society is built. So for example, what about a target on making sure that new homes that are built, that it's cross community. Therefore, you have much more opportunity to give the types of schools we get, children going to those schools because they're local schools. But more importantly, let's look at the exciting things that are going on with free schools and academies across Europe. So if I look at what's going on there, when you're aged 14, you decide that you want to go and specialize. So if you're really into science, you can go to a great science school. It doesn't matter that it might be a school that's funded by, let's say, the Catholic system or the voluntary grammar or the controlled sector, but if science is your thing, you might just end up wanting, irrespective of where you want to go to that science school. If it's IT, IT, if you're really good with your hands and practical, maybe you want to go to a technology college. That's the type of education of the future. And if we open our schools up, and we need to challenge the Catholic Church, is my view, because they've got some fantastic schools. And I, like, I'm, I'm also a Catholic, but I sent my kids to Methody. Why? Because it was the closest school in South Belfast to me, but I thought they offered really good sports. <laughs> I wanted my kids to get into the sports. So there's lots of reasons why parents choose education. We've got to give parents a choice, but we've got to be realistic about what we can achieve. Uh, thanks for watching. I just want to, I'm going to come in with a couple of comments uh, from uh, our voters here. I'm going to go over here because we, we haven't heard from you yet, uh, and then I'll come back Hi, here uh, again. I'm David, and I'm from Colerain. 
Uh, each one of you have stood up and talked about integration of education as key. But North Coast is the only integrated school around the North Coast area. And people come from Garva, Cushendon and all that, but our schools face and closer. All the rest, Catholic schools and Protestant schools still stay open in Korean, but they're facing to close our school down. But you're all arguing integration is key, but ours is the only one facing and closing down. Okay, you're not seeing the, the, the support then. And just a, a couple of uh, comments here. Um, a lot of the focus on the divisions in education seem to be, uh, you seem to be talking about is between Catholic and Protestant. But what about it, the fact that age 11, that 11 year olds are split into intelligence groups. If you don't pass an exam to get into a school, you can't go to that school. You're basically saying the people in this school are better than the people in this school. I know personally around Derry, the people in the grammar school think they're better than us, even though we're coming from the exact same grades and the exact same exams. What are you going to do about that? Um, like following from Sarah's point as well, like when you're 11, you're doing your 11 plus um, because you're being split into a grammar school and a non-grammar school. Like at the age of 11, your mind is totally elsewhere. I know when I was 11 years of age, my focus wasn't exactly my 11 plus. Um, my brother as well, he's just finished like his exams, obviously for the grammar schools now. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, like as well, like we're do, we get to GCSEs, we get to A-levels, everybody, no matter what type of school you're at, you're sitting the same exam, and then you have people in grammar schools thinking they're like so much given this big thing that they're all great because they're at a grammar school whenever we're sitting the same education. And do you think, <clears throat> I understand grades and everything are really important, but if there's such this big emphasis that you are all putting on uh, integrated education, then why isn't it happening more? Why do you not think that integrated education teaches you a lot more than just a grammar school to get you uh, a grammar Catholic school teaching you about Christianity and what you're supposed to believe in when we're actually getting life lessons? When you go to work in an office, you're not going to be only put in a Catholic or a Protestant office. You have to mix with these people every day once you leave at 18. Thanks so much. Yep. Um. I'm going, to, I'm going to hold it, Mark. I want to ask uh, our candidates just to think about, um, think about what they've heard there and, and reflect that, if they will, in their closing statements, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, I'm going to give you about a minute just to kind of uh, give the last final punchy sell, hopefully, uh, from your point of view. But before we get to that, uh, I just want to give another vote, uh, really, just to give us a sense of, of where everybody sits here at the moment. Now, having uh, talked about Europe and talked about issues that flow from Europe and, and that impact upon our attitudes to Europe, uh, this is uh, a vote that could happen, perhaps, in the UK. Uh, and uh, what we want uh, is to hear from you. And uh, the question really is, if a referendum were held tomorrow on whether the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland, of course, should remain in the European Union, what, which way would you vote? So, the vote is to, to remain within the European Union or not. Uh, would you vote, one, for yes, to stay a member of the European Union, two, no, to leave the European Union, three, don't know or wouldn't vote. So everybody get ready to vote, and if you could please vote now. So there we have it. Okay, it's a big majority uh, want to stay in uh, the European Union, 93%. Uh, we've got somebody who wants to leave and uh, a couple who don't know. So they are. Uh, well done, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking part in that vote. So before you give your, your final and closing statements, uh, our uh, party representatives and our candidates now know, and you've got a very pro-European audience here, uh, and uh, they want to hear now, and you've got effectively one minute uh, to try and persuade these people perhaps to change the way they, they, they voted at the beginning of this uh, or uh, just to stick with you uh, if that's how they voted earlier on. Uh, and uh, I'm going to reverse the order in which we did it uh, earlier and uh, I'll start uh, with Tina uh, and ask you to keep it just to about a minute and uh, then pass the microphone along. 
I'm absolutely delighted that first of all you want to stay in Europe. It shows that you're not all inclusive looking like most of our society is and uh, well, some of our society is today. Um, I'm excited by the fact that you are challenging people, that you've got the confidence. Some of the comments here is brilliant. You know, I actually, my closing remarks is that it's time for fresh politics in Northern Ireland. It's time for the 21st century. It's time for people like you to go home and tell your mummies and daddies. I know you voted the way you voted all the time, but actually for me, I need a new Northern Ireland. Ireland. I need fresh politics. We don't want what we're, say, like what we're saying here today. It's time for us to get our voices out there in Northern Ireland. We need jobs. We need teachers. We need a better society. We need opportunities. And until we get actually, and I, I'm sorry for being so strong because I'm so passionate. It's why I got involved. It's why I came home. I love this place. We have to be strong. We have to tell some of these people it ain't good enough and we're going to change it together. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Jim. I'm sort of wondering whether I should change my opinion on a referendum and actually have it now, today, and uh, get it over and done with and get a good, a good result and put it past us. Okay, thank you all for your, for your engagement. It's been uh, very, very good for us to hear the feedback, uh, particularly on uh, integrated, integrated education. And maybe uh, if I just use the balance of my time just to, get, to actually answer the questions to why people are frustrated that this isn't happening quick enough, and particularly what's happening on the North Coast, what we're seeing is actually that the two different sectors are defending themselves. Integrated education has been, has been, been seen as part of a problem whenever we have declining enrolments rather than being part of the, of the solution where we're actually bringing people together have better education better finances better economic outcomes and that's the problem people are actually protecting their vested interests rather than looking to a new innovative solution and, and shared education is actually a bit of a danger in this regard because it's actually a watering down of integration it should be part of a spectrum not seen as an alternative that's not real integration thank you So just to repeat what I said at the start, we are a party that's a pan-European party, uh, 48 MEPs, 15 different countries. It shows that we are working together right across Europe, and that's what we need for Northern Ireland. And not only are we working together, but we're working for our future as young people. And you know whether that's to do with the, the environment or whether it's to do with things like youth unemployment, we're putting these as our priority. We want to change democracy in Europe, to make Europe more responsive to the people, not just the big businesses and not just the wealthy individuals. We're the only party in the Northern Ireland Assembly that publishes all our corporate or publishes all our donations and does not accept corporate donations. You have to ask your other representatives where are they getting their money from and whose agenda are, are, are they driving. And fundamentally, you know when we say we want to change things, what does change actually mean? What do these guys mean when they say change? When we say we want to change Europe, we want to see a green industrial revolution. It's very clear. That's what we're backing. That's what we want to change. And it's all for the interest of the common good. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for, for having me. This has been a very interesting discussion. Um, in, in responding to some of the, the last couple of questions, I think that the statistics on emigration are very worrying. I think it, it's quite clear, particularly coming from a rural area, that we're educating our young people for emigration. Um, emigration isn't a lifestyle choice. Um, it's something that peop young people are being forced into because there isn't enough good jobs um, for people to access to allow them to stay at home. And unfortunately, some government ministers, um, none of them in the north have been daft enough to say it, but in the south and in Britain, some of them have actually claimed that emigration is a lifestyle choice. Um, in terms of the, the debate on integrated education, um, it, it's widely accepted that there's far too much segregation in our schools. Um, schools are segregated by religion, they're segregated by sex, and they're segregated by social class. And all of that needs to change. Um, my concern about integrated education and the concern of many within my community isn't about religion. It's about access um, to our cultural identity. Um, as, an, as an Irish citizen, um, I want my children to have access to learn the Irish language, to have access to participate in Gaelic games. And the concern that I want to see addressed by those in the integrated education sector is that young people will still have access um, to those services um, through the integrated education system. The final point I want to make is that on the 22nd of May, you're going to be faced with an important choice. And the first one is, do you go and vote or not? And I would encourage each of you to go and vote regardless of who you're going to vote for, regardless of which particular party or independent candidate you support, please get out and use your vote and vote for somebody. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think, I think today and on occasions like today is always good for politicians because it's never an easy task. It's always easier to say what you should do rather than what you actually do. And today to come here as a politician, it always puts all your views, all your opinions, all your policies in a context of there are others who have a different view and have a different opinion.
But I believe on the 22nd of May, the people of Northern Ireland will yet again have another choice, to either vote for a party or parties which clearly have demonstrated that they are prepared to face up to the real challenges, actually be truthful, and for some parties to talk about dark sides, to come clean and say, well, exactly, this is what our past has been, but this is going to be our future. And I think that on the 22nd, the DUP has a record of delivery, a delivery that says we recognize that we're different, we recognize there are challenges, but any society must have core values at its heart because we just can't abandon our principles for the sake of it, it, it all looks good, it all sounds lovely, and it all is very sexy in a sense. But when the rubber hits the road, there are hard choices that have to be made, and the hard choices are these. Will you have a job when you leave school? Will you have a future? Will you have a, a, a way whereby your young people, your children, will ensure that in the future they stay in Northern Ireland? And I think that what we've seen today is that the parties have different views. The choices will be made by the electorate, and I'm quite happy and confident that the DUP on the 22nd of May will be given again an endorsement for its policies in a way that reflects the progress that it has made for the benefit of the people of Northern Ireland. Well, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, next up, thank you, Reverend Story. Um, and uh, could we please have uh, Mark Brotherson? Mark. Here I am again, guys. Remember, I started off at zero. Someone please vote for me. <laughs> Only joking. What I'd like to say is, listening to the debate today, what started to permeate through for me is going back to my statement at the start, where it's about jobs, jobs, jobs. It's about the economy. Absolutely focused. The NI Conservatives, remember this. We are the largest party in Northern Ireland. We have 304 MPs at Westminster. We have 8,500 councillors and 25 MEPs. Not quite as much as the Greens, but they don't have many MPs. So don't think NI Conservatives are the small party in Northern Ireland. We are the Conservatives in Northern Ireland. We're focused totally on the economy and education system, as you've heard me talk about. And from an economics and an educational background, we need to focus our skills development, our curriculum, by listening to the workforce, listening to new organizations. We need to, we need to get integrated education high on the agenda. I would, I would also say we need to start legislating for that. We need to start looking at our education system now. It's actually split 50-50 between the, contain, uh, the, the control, the maintained, the, the grammar. There's a 50-50 split. Let's take an example from further and higher education, which is fully integrated. It's about skills development. It's about upskilling you, facilitating your opportunities for you to get work. We have created 39,000 private sector jobs have been created since 2012 by the, by the Conservatives. Now, we do claim credit for that here in Northern Ireland in the, in, in the, in the executive, but think about where the, where the funding comes from, where the decisions are made, and ask yourself this question. Why should you not be afforded the opportunity to vote for a party that has national interest? at UK that's going to have a massive influence on how the European Union relationship is formed going forward. Vote for the NI Conservatives and we will lead change for you. Thanks. Thanks Mark. If you want to give uh, uh, Mark Brothers in there. And uh, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, Danny Kinn for the uh, Ulster Unions. Danny Kinn, but I remember I'm here really for Jim Nicholson. And I go back to what I said at the beginning. Jim has been there for years and knows how the business works and how to get it changed. The rest of us are the people that create the change that makes it work. When you look at that figure up there, we know Europe is needed, we know it's got to work, but we know change is needed. When it gets to the education system, when we talk of a shared system, it isn't a watering down of integrated. It is trying to get every other school to start changing as well, with integrated as your goal, and getting everyone as close as you can get. That's how we've got to change the education system. But the key to all of this is laying down a system where you can all travel around the world, be prepared for the world, get jobs wherever you want, come home if you want to. But we want to see Northern Ireland thrive. You've got to have a Northern Ireland economy that brings jobs in for everybody. And I go back and Phil is absolutely right. The vital thing in the rest of your lives, please, is promise us when you leave today that you will vote. And you will vote every time. Because that's what will create the change. It's all of you taking part. Thank you much, uh, Danny. Danny, get in there. And uh, finally, uh, Alex Atwood. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thanks to everybody here. So I'm a different generation from you. I'm 55. 
I'm probably older than many of your parents, but my children are younger than any of you. They are aged five and seven. So your concerns and your worries and your hopes that you've expressed today are mine because I worry that my Anna and Nora will end up being one or two of the 30% who said earlier that their long-term ambition was to be outside Northern Ireland. So I worry about all of that. So what's the answer? The answer, and this is what you've told me, is not to be defeatist. It is to be ambitious and to be hopeful, and we have reason to be so. Your parents, all of your parents, stood for democracy in this part of Ireland when there were people trying to destroy it. And your parents and other parties, not all, but other parties, signed up to a new beginning to policing that saw people from an earlier generation being able to join the PSNI, free, free very often from threat or terror. So what do I conclude? I conclude what I always say, be relentlessly positive, because, and this is where I'll finish, uh, over the last three months I've campaigned, campaigned across the north, and I've seen great people, great citizens, great communities, great businesses, great schools, great farmers. There is a wealth of wisdom and talent in this part of the world, which says to me to be relentlessly positive. And what you have said to us today, and what I conclude from what you, hear, what you say, is that you, your generation, want us to be relentlessly positive in order to further transform the society that we live in, given that that society has begun to stall and stagnate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Alex so, we've heard uh, from all of our candidates again there. We've had a, a good debate. Thank you very much for, all, uh, for participating in it uh, and giving us your views and challenging our politicians uh, to answer your concerns. Uh, so I don't know whether you've changed your mind, perhaps you haven't, perhaps uh, you're pretty much where you were when you began, that's entirely your right. But let's just take a, a, a kind of a test again to see where we all sit. Uh, and uh, the question is, if you could vote in the European election, which party would you vote for as a first preference? And there are your options. Uh, number one, STLP. Number two, Sinn Féin. Three, DUP. Four, UUP. Five, TUV, Conservative or UKIP. Six, Green, NI21 or Alliance. Seven, none, wouldn't vote or would spoil my vote. So, everybody ready to vote? And if I could ask you to vote now. So let's see, are we going to have any change? Okay, here we are. There are our votes again. So it is, uh, have we, let me see, we've got one, have we? <laughs> we you've, you've actually, you've, you've swung five votes uh, have, have jumped into uh, the, the, it was, I think it was Jim Allister won those votes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what it was. Let's, uh, are we able to go back to what was uh, earlier on? We'll, we'll try and do this. So we can see 26, uh, we've got 59% there in, in that, uh, the biggest category, which was uh, the Green NI21 Alliance. So let's see how things have changed uh, looking at that slide. OK. So you can see a slight drop uh, in, um, oh. I think, uh, so what are we looking at? We'd, we'd, we'd increase, definitely there was an increase there between Green and I-21 Alliance. There was an increase uh, for the TUV and Conservatives, but I think there was a bit of a drop for uh, SCLP and Sinn Féin, and I didn't see. <laughs> so, uh, well, it, what it goes to show, uh, folks, uh, we'll, we'll see what plays out on election day, uh, but certainly um, what, uh, what all of you need to be mindful of is that voting is a choice. It's, 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 it's a, a right that everybody has, uh, and uh, one that you should hold dear, and you are entitled to vote whatever way you want, and you are, as ever, entitled uh, to change your mind. Uh, so that's us uh, for today, folks. Could I ask you just to give a very big thank you to all of our uh, candidates and our, our parties taking part? And uh, I could ask me perhaps uh, our, our parties and our candidates uh, to offer a thank you to our, our young people for... For their participation. Um, 
Thanks very much uh, to Bill for uh, keeping us right with all of our voting. Uh, an important thing, folks, these don't actually work, uh, the video controller, or uh, they don't actually do <laughs> any good uh, for playing uh, computer games. So please, please, please make sure you hand back the little remotes. They are uh, expensive items, and they've been very useful to us today. Thanks very much to our organisers today. I think it's all been very worthwhile. Uh, have a great uh, bank holiday weekend, and good luck uh, with the studies and everything else in the future. Thank you all. Thank you.